Hello and welcome to a briefing on government business forwarded during proceedings of the House of Assembly sitting on Tuesday the 2nd of June, Wednesday the 3rd of June and the Senate sitting on Thursday the 4th of June 2020. My name is Jesse Leons. In the Honorable House this week, Parliament approves the U.S. $7.9 million for the joint venture to upgrade the Millennium Highway and West Coast Road. The House approves financial relief for St. Lucian residents in the form of an extended period for barrel concessions from now, June 2020, to January 2021. In addition, the parliamentary opposition lends support for government's proposed Labour Code amendment to extend the layoff period during national crises like this pandemic, COVID-19, and the tourism levy bill intended to help small tourism-related businesses is pulled from the order paper ahead of the sitting of the Senate pending further review, acknowledging legitimate concerns with the proposed legislation. First order of business. Added to the well-advanced preparations for the reconstruction of the Millennium Highway and West Coast Road, the government of St. Lucia has received approval in Parliament to fulfill its funding commitment to the joint venture. By way of a loan from the Caribbean Development Bank's Ordinary Capital Resources, OCR, of an amount not exceeding U.S. $7,945,000, the government of St. Lucia will keep its end of the bargain in the EC $99.4 million undertaking. Minister for Infrastructure, Ports, Energy and Labor, the Honorable Stevenson King, gave a breakdown of how the Millennium Highway and West Coast Reconstruction Project will be bankrolled. The proposed project will be financed in the following ways. A loan from the government of Saint, of, um, to the government of St. Lucia by the CDB of an amount not exceeding the equivalent of $7.945 million, which is what we are here to this evening debating and for which we anticipate approval. That, Mr. Speaker, represents 15% of the project cost. 15% of project cost is what forms our commitment to the project. Then a grant to the government of St. Lucia of an amount not exceeding the equivalent of $27.83 million, which is U.S. $35.342 million from CDB's SFR, which is the allocation from resources provided by the United Kingdom through the Department of International Development under the United Kingdom Caribbean Infrastructure Fund, UKCIF Resources, requests representing 67% of the project cost. So 67% comes from the United Kingdom. Counterpart funding of EC 24.61 million, representing 17% of project costs to finance land acquisition, project preparation, institutional strengthening, project management, and to partly finance infrastructure works. Reconstruction of the Millennium Highway will cost approximately EC $32.2 million and the West Coast Road EC $66.2 million. The interest rate on the U.S. $7.9 million loan to partly finance the project is 4.8% per annum on the amount of the loan withdrawn and outstanding. The commitment rate is payable at a rate of 1% per annum on the amount of the OCR portion unwithdrawn. The loan is repayable in 48 equal or approximately equal and consecutive quarterly installments on each first day of January, first day of April, and first day of October of each year, commencing on the first due date immediately following the expiration of five years after the date of the loan agreement on a later due date that the Caribbean Development Bank specifies in writing. Providing a status update on the Millennium Highway and West Coast Reconstruction Project in the House of Assembly on Tuesday, Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, the Honorable Alan Chastney, indicated that the feasibility study and final design were complete and disclosed that contractor bids were being evaluated this week. The next component will see the construction of a roundabout at the junction of the Millennium Highway, West Coast Road, East Coast Road commonly referred to as the cul-de-sac junction, and the reconstruction of the bridge at Ancillary. We're really hopeful that we can start seeing construction, particularly on the Millennium Highway, as quickly as possible. We want to take advantage, Mr. Speaker, of the fact that schools are shut right now until September. 
also we don't have our doors open to any tourism and even if we were to open our doors we're not expecting that tourists are going to be traversing the island in the initial part like they did before so it really is to use this opportune time mr speaker to commence um, the work the work at hand that was Honorable Alan Shasney, Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, Economic Growth, Job Creation, External Affairs and the Public Service. The Millennium Highway and West Coast Reconstruction Project, upon completion, will improve commutes, road safety efficiency, enhance sectors reliant on this key infrastructure and build climate resilience of the roads. Now, speaking of climate resilience, St. Lucia is scheduled to benefit from road improvement works fully funded by the government of Japan through the Japan International Corporation Agency, JICA. The Kadisak Bridge Reconstruction Project, earmarked for later this month, is designed to build climate resilience in St. Lucia's infrastructure. The project, running alongside the Millennium Highway and West Coast Reconstruction Initiative, includes road realignment work, expansion of the existing bridge, river retraining, and involvement in the construction of the proposed cul-de-sac roundabout. Minister for Infrastructure, Ports, Energy, and Labor, the Honorable Stevenson King, explained that the project is designed to address flooding in that prone area and will be supervised by engineers from the Department of Infrastructure. What the Japanese are going to do in cul-de-sac, Mr. Speaker, is just not to put two I-beams across the river and put slabs on it and say we have a bridge and say it costs $42 million. It's much more than this. The studies which had to be done, Mr. Speaker, to determine the hydrology of the river in terms of the flow and, and all of this thing, Mr. Speaker, because it's not water running down a hill, it's water settling in, 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 in a floodplain. And it is likely if the hydrolo hydrology, Mr. Speaker, isn't adequate, you are, to have, you are likely to have much more rapid flooding than ever before. The Japanese were the ones, Mr. Speaker, who undertook all of the feasibilities, all of the feasibilities, design, finance, engineering, you name it, all of the feasibilities, costing, Mr. Speaker. We will merely, we will merely, merely the recipients of donor funds. Reconstruction of the cul-de-sac bridge will cost an estimated EC $42 million courtesy the Japanese government, and take 24 months to build, commencing this month, June. In more Parliament news, the government of St. Lucia sought permission to guarantee two World Bank dispersed loans in the Honorable House this week for the Caribbean Regional Communications Infrastructure Program, CARSIP, and the Human Capital Resilience Project. The government's guarantee for the CARSIP loan taken out by the Caribbean Telecommunications Union will result in financing in the sum of U.S. $4.1 million to complete St. Lucia's end of the regional connectivity infrastructure to increase bandwidth, ICT-led innovation to remain competitive globally, and implementation support, integration and harmonization of regulations, as well as training activities and business incubation loans. In his bid, Prime Minister and Minister for Finance, the Honorable Alan Chasney, reiterated the significance of CARSIP and the convenience of this loan. I'm very grateful that we were able to secure this money at this time, particularly at the cost of the money, um, at a very, very low rate, Mr. Speaker, for a period of 20 years, actually, sorry, for 40 years, Mr. Speaker, um, in, in total. Uh, so. Uh, while this will increase our debt to GDP, Mr. Speaker, but the fact is the burden on the coffers to pay this loan back are at relatively inexpensive, Mr. Speaker. And when one considers the significant capacity change it's going to make both for us and our daily, daily lives and the opportunity for attracting more people into St. Lucia because of, of this additional broadband width, and more importantly, Mr. Speaker, a critical component of this project is the development of our youth and giving them the opportunity now to open up their own businesses to compete on an international basis. The motion was approved in both houses this week. Parliament also approved this week a draft value-added tax order that is on the rate of a tax on goods and services provided by hotels and other providers in the tourism sector to vary the rate of tax for goods and services provided by hotels and other providers in the tourism sector and the draft value-added tax amendment of Schedule 2 order to amend Schedule 2 of the Act. 
uh, and that is to A, set the rate of tax for goods and services provided by hotels and other providers in the tourism sector as follows. The rate of 7% tax applying with regard to a supply of an accommodation service, a water sports service, a tour conducted by land, air, or sea within St. Lucia that does not include transportation provided by an external provider. The rate of 10% tax applies with regard to a supply of food and beverages, including alcoholic beverages by a restaurant or an admission service to heritage sites and other touristic attractions. In Schedule 2, under Item 1, uh, A, by deleting the definition of commercial rental establishment, and B, by deleting the definition of dwelling, and by substituting a new definition that outlines the places that are not considered a dwelling. Under Item 2, by deleting Paragraph M, and by substituting a new paragraph to specify the type of accommodation service that is exempted. In other tourism matters, amid concerns over certain sections of the draft of the tourism levy bill and after careful consideration, the government of St. Lucia pulled the proposed legislation from the order paper after the House of Assembly sitting. It acknowledged that the bill might seem ambiguous, thus giving rise to a certain level of misunderstanding and misinterpretation. A statement from the Office of the Prime Minister indicates that the Act, which intends to help small tourism-related businesses, is too important a piece of legislation to be misunderstood. This legislation is intended to complement what is being done with village tourism, the marketing of brand and other destination enhancement programs to further incorporate and provide benefits to small and medium-sized tourism and hospitality businesses. An early start to the barrel concessions period has been approved in the Parliament. This week, the bill to amend the usual Christmas barrel concession was passed, allowing St. Lucians to enjoy duty-free barrels now from June, instead of the usual November start. First mentioned in the Social Stabilization Plan by the Honourable Prime Minister, the Honourable Alan Chasney, in an address to the nation, this initiative is part of a wide range of relief measures to help citizens cushion the social and economic shock brought on by the ongoing pandemic. Mr. Speaker, my government recommended the following, that the Bauer Concession Program commence on June 2nd to run for eight months and expire on January 31st, 2021. The number of barrels granted under this program be restricted to two barrels to each household. That the beneficiaries of the concession be granted 100% waiver of import duty, excise tax on unsolicited personal items, food, clothing, toys, and other household concessions in barrels imported, that the concession not apply to electronic items, that persons are to pay the requisite taxes, duties, and charges on barrels outside of the concessionary provisions as applicable in normal trade, that the unusual penalties and fines be applied if goods are used for commercial purposes, and there will be an upper limit of $2,500 per barrel on the value of items qualified. The application of requisite taxes, duties on charges, and non-provisional items like electronics or commercial goods remain. And finally, a bill, the Labor Amendment Act, seeking to increase the layoff period during a national crisis like COVID, has been passed. The layoff period as enshrined in the Labor Code, or the Labor Act as it is known, is to allow a business person to faced with the condition to lay off its workers for a period of 12 weeks, three months. Upon the, uh, the expiration of the three months, the employer, therefore, would, it means that that period would, would qualify for severance and the employer would have to pay the worker severance fee. But with COVID and other nat um, natural disasters, which may protract that period of downtime, and a very slow it gives the employer the opportunity to benefit from an extended period which period would be declared by the minister so once a national emergency is declared and it is protracted over a long extended period the minister can make a declaration and extend it by a further 12 weeks to allow for a longer period of time for recovery and to get the business back on its feet. However, it doesn't disadvantage the workers because if the worker, the employee, feels that he rather just um, at least sever his own relationship with the, with the employer, 
then it means that the employer would have to pay him his severance pay after the, after the three months. The redundancy, um, his redundancy after the, um, the three months and to allow him to move on with, with his own business. While the employer, it gives him that extra period of time to, to recover to full business. And that extension, Mr. Speaker, is only provided for periods such as a national disaster, um, a pandemic, or other situations such as these. Now that concludes the highlights of the parliamentary sittings of this week of the lower house, the House of Assembly, on the 2nd and 3rd of June, as well as the sitting of the Senate, the upper house, on the 4th of June. My name is Jesse Leon signing off for now. Do stay tuned for more NTN programming.